Good morning, church family. I'm so grateful to be here with you all this morning, continuing in this series called Drama King. If you were new to the church this morning, if you're new into the series over the last three weeks and moving forward over the course of this summer, looking at the drama, the tension, the conflict that occurs over the course of the kings of Israel and soon to be the, the kings of Israel and Judah as the kingdom's going to split up today and learning some of the lessons that God has to teach Teach us along the way. And we get to continue in that series this morning. Before we jump in, and if you have your Bibles, you can open up to 1 Kings 11. That's where we're going to be, 1 Kings 11. If you're new to the Bible and you get to a word that, uh, a book that ends in Ayah, Zephaniah, Isaiah, Jeremiah, you've gone too far, okay? So 1 Kings, that's where we're going. And but before we, we go there, I want to share, uh, earlier this year, I, I found a, an old picture of myself and my sister with our dad playing with Duplos. And, and we decided that we were going to duplicate this photo with my own children. So we, we have a bunch of kids uh, uh, so far. The, the count keeps going up. But we have a seven, five, three, and one-year-old. Uh, these three boys right here were helping me in this project. So yes, we haven't slept in years. <laughs> I know some of you can relate. Well, we decided we were going to duplicate this photo from the early 90s. That's, that's a little Zachy right there. And then these are my kids. And one of the things that pops up whenever I look at old photos or I talk to people who, who, uh, who knew my dad growing up is, is I always hear how similar I am to my father. Not just in, in, in ways that I've looked like him over the years, but some of the mannerisms, some of the quirkiness, some of the issues. And when I look at photos like this or I show people photos of myself when I was little, they're always very quick to point out how much my oldest son, Ath his name's Athanasius, he's named after, we call him Thay. How much Thay looks like little Zachy. And that's one of the first things we look at, but it's not just, it's not just looks. Again, when you look back at old photos, you might remember uh, some of the other things you've inherited from your parents as well. Have you ever met someone and over the course of talking to them, maybe you meet their parents and you're like, oh wow, you're definitely so-and-so's kid. <laughs> or you're definitely, just by the way that they're talking and moving and the mannerisms and everything. It's so interesting how much we kind of pick up and absorb from our parents. And it's not all good things. A lot of you know, you got kids, they will absorb some of your worst habits as well. In fact, so you, you, you'll find yourself in one of those moments. You're like, wait a second, where did you hear that? You're like, oh, you heard it from me. <laughs> and you see the habits that they pick up along the way. But sometimes it's worse than just habits. Some of us grew up in homes where perhaps the struggle was more apparent going to the bottle or to a pill. And over time, that was something that perhaps you picked up along the way as well. Maybe you grew up in a home in which you saw some pretty vicious fighting. And now in your own life with your roommates or with your spouse, you find yourself kind of reliving some of the fights that you watched growing up. One of the things we're going to look at today as we go through, uh, continue in this series in 1 Kings 11, and really our main point for today is that generational baggage often just can't be avoided. And we're going to see that in the text, that generational baggage is real and people got to deal with it. However, there is hope at the end of the day that it can be overcome. A generational baggage often cannot be avoided. However, there is hope that it can be overcome. And so we're going to start. We're going to read 1 Kings 11, verses 11 through 13. Last week, Pastor Rick left off with Solomon, King Solomon, wisest man who ever lived, who took a ton of wives and then made a bunch of poor choices. And there's a consequence for the poor choices he made. You left off with, with, uh, a salt, with Pastor Rick talking about the need to guard our hearts because of the influences that are out there in the world. And so there's a consequence to the idolatry that Solomon allowed to enter the kingdom. And that's where we get to pick up today. And so, 1 Kings 11, verse 11. Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon... Since this has been your practice, you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you. I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servant. Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hands of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, 
but I will give one tribe. That's just a measure of mercy right there, by the way. I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. All right, real quick, a little bit of history. We got some maps here. When the people of God were wandering through the wilderness and they finally entered into the promised land, they were given an inheritance. They were, they were, each of the tribes, except Levi, was given a different place to dwell. And then you had the time of the judges and people were making lots of terrible decisions and things were getting worse and worse. And finally, they cried out for a king to unite all of them and really was asserting a, a power and control. And that's where Saul comes in, which you talked about a couple of weeks ago. Now, what we're about to get into is the consequence of Solomon's idolatry. And what is about to happen is the kingdom is going to split such that you will have the southern kingdom, Judah, which has Simeon kind of uh, absorbed in there, and then the rest of the tribes up to the north. This is what's coming. And our first point that I want us to think about here, and this sounds kind of obvious, but we're laying groundwork for the rest of the sermon, is this. Our actions have generational consequences. Our actions often have generational consequences. And one of the things that I always find interesting when, when I think about this, I'm used to my mic being here, not here, so that's a little bit of a change. I gotta not touch my chest at all, okay, doing this. I always find it really interesting looking at generational differences. Okay? Now you think about Gen Z, teens, early 20s. They did not choose to grow up in a world full of social media. That was not their choice. That was created by other people, by older people, and it was given to them or it was thrust upon them. And as a result, we have young people growing up with the greatest mental health issues our country's ever seen all tied around people wrestling with how in the world are we supposed to interact with this social media stuff. In fact, you get some kids who feel like they have to perform from a very young age because of how often their photos are posted on social media and they have no idea how much privacy they have or whether or not the world's going to get to see whatever it is that they're doing. They didn't get to choose that. But the actions of our, the parents and the grandparents and those that come before them are kind of thrust upon the next generation to grapple with and to figure it out. Now, I'm a millennial, and there's a really interesting name that the older generations came up with for the millennials, which is often deserved. It rhymes with Moflake, Snowflake, because we tend to be the fragile generation. That's what a lot of people poke fun at us for, Okay. But something really interesting happened in the 80s. In the 80s, on milk cartons, something started showing up. Anybody remember? All right, missing kids started showing up. And the news outlets captured it everywhere. And all of a sudden, the rise of this thing in the 80s, some of you remember, called Stranger Danger. Now, it took years, years, over a decade, for the major news outlets to debunk this. It took years. They didn't tell people that 99 point whatever percent of child abductions happened by friends and family. But what happened is you had a generation of people raised to be afraid of talking to strangers. So much so that a Stanford dean recently wrote a book talking about how there are kids, who 18, 19 year olds who get lost on campus, won't ask someone for help. They'll call home <laughs> and ask their parents to pull up a map. It's crazy. How do I get to class? And this is happening more and more. Think about it this way. What happens to evangelism when a generation gets raised to be afraid of talking to strangers? Actions have generational consequences. But it's not all bad. It can be good. And there's people in this room who are here precisely because of the generational faithfulness of your parents, of your grandparents, of your friends, of the people who, whose shoulders you stand on as you walk in your own faith and grow in your knowledge and affection of God. It can go both ways. For Solomon, unfortunately, it didn't go the right way. He made a terrible choice and God said, you're not going to have to deal with the consequences, but your kids will. And that was handed down to them. Now, we don't know exactly how bad it's going to be. We don't know how long it's going to last. We're going to see how the kids are going to respond along the way. But what happens is a man named Jeroboam comes on the scene. 
And Jeroboam rises up in Solomon's house, and a prophet comes to this guy, Jeroboam, and he says, We're gonna pull, God's going to pull away the ten tribes, and he's going to give them to you. And Solomon hears about this, and he gets upset, and he tries to take out Jeroboam, and Jeroboam flees. He goes to Egypt. And so, eventually Solomon dies, and Rehoboam, his son, rises to the throne. Now, Jeroboam isn't on the scene yet, but Rehoboam now has the entire kingdom to himself. And he's got a choice to make. How am I going to rule? How am I going to rule? And so he goes to the wise older men and he asks them, how is it that I should rule? And this is what they respond in 1 Kings 12, 4 and 5. He said, your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. He said to them, go away for three days, then come again to me. And so the people went away. Now, he also went to some young, some young people, some of his friends. You can call them punks. You could probably get away with calling them that. And he asked them, what should I do? And they said, lean in hard. Let them know you got the power. Let them know you're in control. Go heavy. They haven't seen nothing yet with Solomon compared to what they're going to get with Rehoboam. That's what they told him. Second point. Give the right people permission to speak into your life. Now, last week, Pastor Rick, he talked about how important it is to guard your heart from influences in the world. But I would like to encourage you this morning, in the same way that Rehoboam heard from the people, and then he went to the, 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 younger, the, the younger folks who basically told him what he wanted to hear, that each of us has a responsibility to actually seek out and to set up for ourselves the right voices that we know we need in our lives. Now, if you've got little kids, you know you love having this for them. You want them to have good, godly men and women around them giving them advice. If you're a child, just so you know, the first person to do this is your parents, okay? You don't get to choose. That is set up for you. Sorry, deal with it. But for the adults in the room, I have always tried, especially the last 10 years, to have three to five men with whom I explicitly say, hey, you have permission to call out the dumb in my life. When I'm doing things my way instead of God's way, when you see such and such happening in my marriage, when I'm making some poor, I need you, I need you to be willing to call me out. And if, if you've never explicitly given that permission to someone, I would challenge you today. Rehoboam's issue is he did not listen to the right voices. He listened to the voices that were not wise, that were not experienced. He listened to the young voices who were all about power and control. And because of it, the kingdom was going to be ripped from him. And I think for us, as we navigate our lives, as we navigate friendship, as we navigate the workplace, kids, as you navigate school and sports teams, adults, as you navigate marriage, you got to have people who are ahead of you and whatever that sphere is telling you and giving you advice along the way. And I will just say, like, people are not born natural friends. I've learned this watching kids. Because kids, I'm sorry, you can be awkward. You throw a bunch of you on, on the schoolyard. It, it, can, it can get weird. <laughs> Friendship doesn't come natural to a lot of people. Marriage isn't a skill set you just pick up. Parenting is not just a skill set you wake up with. We do our best to keep them alive. But yes, it takes, it takes a lot of work. And every time I spend time with older couples or older, um, uh, older parents, I'm trying to absorb and learn and figure out. Because, yeah, I'm four kids in and my oldest is seven, but i got a long ways to go. You need to give the right people permission to speak into your life as well as guarding your heart from the noise, as Pastor Rick mentioned last week. So, Jeroboam, the one that Solomon booted out, the one that the prophet said, hey, you're going to get the ten tribes. He hears that Solomon has passed away, and he comes back. And that's where we find ourselves in 1 Kings 
12, 20. And it says, when all Israel heard that Jeroboam had returned, they sent and called him to the assembly and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. Again, that tribe in the south. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived there. And he went out from there and built Penuel. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now the kingdom will turn back to the house of David. If this people go up to offer offer sacrifices in the temple of the Lord of Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn again to their Lord, to Rehoboam, king of Judah. And they will kill me and return to Rehoboam, king of Judah. So the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. And said to the people, you have gone up to Jerusalem long enough. Behold your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And he set one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. Now listen to this scenario. God told Jeroboam, I'm giving you the kingdom. I'm giving this to you, okay? And Jeroboam kind of got freaked out because people were supposed to go to Jerusalem for festivals and feasts. And so instead, what did he do? Instead of receiving the gift that God was going to give him, he set up idols, and he used this as an excuse to set up idols in the north to keep the people from going down to the south. My next point for us to think about. We are temporary guardians, not owners. Whatever it is that we receive from God, we are temporary guardians. We are not owners. Jeroboam saw the people as his. The power was his. The land was his. And once he got a taste of it up in the north, he didn't want to risk anything to lose any of it because in his mind it was no longer God's for him to steward. It was his. And the response was idolatry. Now, kids... I want to point something out for you. When you were little, your parents modeled, especially when you were babies, modeled to you constantly generosity and graciousness. We're talking about sacrificing their time because you'd be up at 2 a.m. screaming and they'd have to be up with you. We're talking about them making food for you. We're talking about them cleaning up your nasty diapers. It was nonstop sacrifice non-stop generosity. And this is what parents of tiny children are constantly modeling because you have to give up what you want in order to meet the needs of your children. And having kids is a lot like the Lord putting a big mirror in your face that shows you and reminds you how selfish you are. But kids, at some point, probably between one and two, after modeling all this generosity and modeling all this grace to you and all of this sacrificial service, at one point your parents gave you something that wasn't yours. They gave it to you, and they went to ask for some of it back. Maybe they took you to McDonald's, and they got you a French fry, and they went to grab just one of the French fries that they bought for you, and they went to grab it, at which point you uttered a four-letter word, mine. They didn't have to teach you this. And this is how we know that sin starts in the womb because you don't have to teach a kid to be selfish. You don't. But from a very, very early age, starting at just one or two, we begin with this owner mentality. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. And as you grow up, the temptation continues. This house is not mine to steward, or it's, it's not God's for me to steward, is mine. This paycheck is not God's for me to steward, is mine. This family is not God's for me to steward, is mine. And it's a radically different way at looking at the things and the people in your life. Because parents, your kids do not belong to you, they belong to God. Adults, Your homes are not for you to build your kingdom. They are God's for you to advance his. 
your paychecks, your energy, your time. Those things, we are all but temporary stewards. We are all but temporary guardians. We are not owners. But we have this natural inclination, don't we? And this is why we need people in our life to catch us on this. We have this natural inclination to just tighten in, get really, really tight on our grip and say, "Mm -mm, God, that's mine. That's not yours. People don't got to teach you. It happens naturally. It happens naturally. We got to make sure that we remind ourselves we are temporary guardians. We are not owners. Jeroboam didn't see the people of Israel as God's people, but as his people. And again, he let power, prestige, influence, and fortune creep in and dominate the priorities. But he wasn't the only one to screw up. Rehoboam, who took the south, he screwed up too. We see that in 1 Kings 14, continuing on. It says, And Judah did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And they provoked him to jealousy with their sins that they committed, more than all that their fathers had done. We can't catch a break. Everyone's screwing up left and right. For they also built for themselves high places and pillars and asherim on every high hill and under every green tree. And they were also male cult prostitutes in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations that the Lord drove out before the people of Israel. Our natural tendency is to take the generational baggage that we inherit and to make it worse. This is the tendency of sinful humanity. Heck, even when we get good things, we are great at just ruining them. We take great things and we're good at ruining them. I just learned, there was a giant study done that found if you, are, if you have a ton of wealth and you leave it to your, your, the following generation... 70% of the time, that wealth will be gone in two generations. 90% of the time, that wealth will be gone in three generations. You try to do a great thing and you leave that stuff. Man, it is amazing how we can take a great situation and ruin it. And then you look at Adam and Eve in the garden who were given a fantastic situation, walking with God, intimacy with God, and along comes the temptation to be like God, and they ruin it. You take the people of God wandering around in the wilderness and they get to the promised land and they send 12 spies in and the spies are like, oh, 10 of them, oh, there's a lot of people. People are like, but we have God and they're afraid. So what do they do? They wander for another 40 years. They had a fantastic thing and they ruined it. You take the, God has handed over this land and these people to these kings And over the course of the kings, throughout the book of Kings and the book of Chronicles, time and time again, with a few exceptions, they just make things worse. The book of Judges is all about things just getting worse because that's the sinful tendency of humanity. This is why, going back to the very beginning in Genesis, Genesis 3.15 After humanity had rebelled against God, God promised a solution. He said, he promised someone who would come that was going to step on the snake's heel, crush his head, but it was going to be bruised by by the snake himself. And then God met Abraham and said, through you, the snake crusher's going to come. And then David, through you, the snake crusher's going to come. And the people of God were longing throughout the Old Testament for a king to come who could actually rule, who wouldn't set up idols, who would do what needed to be done. Jesus was the king 2,000 years ago that came to be the king that Saul and David and Solomon and Jeroboam and Rehoboam and every other king simply couldn't be. This is why Jesus came to set up a kingdom that could not falter. But he also came to overcome what is honestly one of our greatest obstacles. Because as you think about the baggage that you've inherited from your family, as you think about the habits, the addictions, the quirks, whatever it might be, your greatest obstacle can't be blamed in any which direction, we got to look inward because one of our biggest issues, one of our greatest obstacles is the sinful human heart. One of our greatest problems is the hardness of the human heart. And throughout the Old Testament, what you have is, is the affections of people's heart 
being pulled in the wrong direction. I often tell people, especially when I'm talking with kids, that this is how a, a way to define sin. When your ultimate affection, when the ultimate affections of your heart are pulled in the wrong direction, that's sin. And it doesn't matter where those affections are being pulled. If they're being pulled towards power or influence or control, like with these kings, that's sin. But if the ultimate affection of your heart falls on your home or on your job or on a promotion or on a a reputation or on kids, that's also sin. Because the only place the ultimate affections of our heart belong ultimately is on Jesus. And in Ezekiel, hundreds of years before Jesus... God knew that we had this heart problem. And he makes this promise in Ezekiel chapter 11. He says, And I will give them one heart, and a new spirit I will put within them, and I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh, and I will give them a heart of flesh. That part of the promise of the Old Testament addresses the actual problem is that when Jesus comes, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to come to change your hearts. So that your ultimate affection is no longer being pulled into the noise and distraction, but is ultimately going to be on Jesus. And it says in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Close with a personal story. You saw a picture of my father up here earlier. A few years after that photo was taken, he left. And he didn't come back. I haven't heard the voice of my father in nearly three decades. And growing up, that was really hard. And for a really long time, when I came across the word father in the Bible... It didn't conjure up the best images for me. Isn't a dad someone who runs when things get hard? Isn't a dad someone who leaves when it's not worth their time anymore? That was the baggage that I had to deal with. And then a decade later, I'm having, I'm married, and I'm having my own kids. And I remember a mentor saying to me, Zach, be the man you want your sons to become. But I've inherited a lot of the issues that my dad had, and I've been, I've, that's been confirmed by many people that knew him. And as I raise my kids, I don't want them to be raised by a harsh man. I don't want them to be raised by an impatient man. I don't want them to be raised by a proud man. And yet I see that I've inherited in my sin from Adam first, but from my dad before me, this baggage. But when I wake up every morning and I get ready for my day, at the beginning of every day, the task of you and me as Christians, if you know Jesus, is to die so that Christ can live in us. That's how generational baggage ultimately is overcome. Because the Christ that died for you on the cross didn't just die so you could spend eternity in heaven, but died so that you could experience healing and wholeness now in the present. That your relationships could experience healing and wholeness now in the present. That you could get glimpses of the kingdom now in the present. And I don't want my kids to be raised by someone with all those tendencies and sometimes it comes out and I have to apologize and then I got to remind them I'm going to fail you but your heavenly father never will but I'm not the one that's going to be patient if anything it's going to be Christ in me and I'm not going to be gentle my tendency is to be harsh that's going to be Christ in me that's the solution he promised in Ezekiel when giving us a new heart That's the promise we get in 2 Corinthians, that the old is gone and the new has come. And if you're a Christian and you haven't prayed that prayer in a while, my encouragement to you, man, lean into the Holy Spirit and be specific where you need the change. And then ask Jesus, I need you to live in me right now. And if you're not a Christian and this kind of healing and wholeness is what you've been yearning, then you got to tell someone and you got to say that prayer. Come talk to me. Come talk to someone else you see on stage. 
We all know what it's like to have generational baggage. Everyone on this planet does. But you can experience what it is to overcome it in this life, but ultimately for eternity. Pray with me. God, I give you thanks that we are a church family here in Southeast Connecticut, across the country, across the globe. I pray, Lord, I pray that you would soften our hearts, that you would challenge our hearts, that we would reach out for help where we need it, that we would cry out to you in humility as we feel prompted. Pray, Lord, that you would equip us, equip us and give us the boldness to lean into you where we so desperately, desperately need you. We ask all these things in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen.